All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. As you can see, the schedule. So we have a, a few great speakers coming up for the remainder of the year. It's been a wonderful year with the uh, Distinguished Speaker Series. And today I am very excited to present, um, see if I can pronounce this correctly, Cedric Blampon, um, who uh, earned his uh, medical degree and then went uh, on to get a, a PhD um, working on the uh, HIV co-receptor with uh, Marc Parmentier. And uh, he went on to the uh, came to the US to do a postdoc with Elaine Fuchs, where he overlapped with our own Bill Lowry, um, studying epidermal stem cells in uh, development. And uh, after that, he moved back to Belgium to start his own research group and really has taken off since then. Um, his group has been incredibly productive and uh, Cedric has earned a number of really incredible awards including the Outstanding Young Investigator from the International Society of Stem Cell Research. I was actually in Japan when Elaine and there was someone from the Belgium government there to uh, honor Cedric. Um, he's also won the EMBO Young Investigator Award as well as the Lillian Betancourt uh, Award for Life Sciences. Um, Cedric's research has been really important in our understanding of how stem cells and progenitor cells behave in tissue development and disease, including cancer. Um, his group has made really substantial discoveries about where stem cells are located in tissues and in tumors and how these cells are regulated. Um, a lot of these studies require making new tools to make these discoveries, including a lot of novel mouse models and other important approaches to answer these critical questions. Um, on a personal note, I would put Cedric on a, a short list of my favorite scientists. So I am really excited to hear his talk. And uh, I'm very excited that, that his research has gone from, from epidermal stem cells to expand into things like heart and mammary gland and even the prostate. Um, and uh, it's, it's especially special to have Cedric right now because I think it's around 9 p.m. in Belgium. So he's stayed up late for us and uh, he's been very generous with his time. So with that, I will we'll turn it over. So thank you, Cedric. Thank you very much, Andrew, for um, the kind introduction. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm, I'm really happy to be here today. And, and um, uh, although, you know, I would uh, even, even prefer to be locally at UCLA uh, other than in Belgium um, late in my office. But uh, anyway, um, I hope uh, uh, we'll, I will share with you, you know, some of our um, recent works on the, on, the, on the mechanism that regulate uh, multipotency uh, in stem cells from um, different uh, glandular um, epithelia. So, um, as you know, uh, stem cells are characterized by uh, two main properties, their capacity to self-renew and to um, differentiate uh, into one or more lineage that constitute their um, tissue of origin. And, and the, the, the range of differentiation uh, vary um, from, uh, from the different type of stem cells. So at the early uh, beginning of, of development, at the Morida stage, um, the, the cells are um, able to differentiate uh, into um, all the somatic tissue, including um, the extraembryonic tissue uh, that form uh, the placenta. And the best example uh, is the, the, the true uh, monozygote uh, twin uh, that come from uh, early cleavage of the, of the morula. But then you have also uh, the pluripotent cells. So it means that the, the, the cells can uh, form all um, the somatic lineage, but they cannot contribute to um, the, the, the formation of the extraembryonic um, tissue. And um, when I start my uh, career in, in, in stem cell biology, people were thinking that most actually of the adult stem cells were uh, multipotent, meaning that um, they were able um, to differentiate into all the cell lineage that constitute uh, their tissue. And, and the best example for that is, is and is still true today, uh, is the hematopoietic stem cell that at the clonal level can differentiate it to all um, the blood um, lineage. And then they were, you know, unipotent stem cell. And, and for a long time, it's, it, it was uh, so that uh, it was, you know, a very um, limited number of tissue that ever uh, 
uh, unipotent stem cell. And, and the best example was, you know, the spermatogonia that only gave rise to um, uh, spermat spermatids and, and spermatozoids. Um, and so um, my lab uh, is studying, um, you know, different type of epithelia. Uh, one uh, um, that I've been trained, uh, as Andrew said, uh, in my uh, early days during my postdoc, I studied uh, with Bill Laurie, uh, the, the, the skin epidermis, and we were particularly interested at the time in the hair follicle stem cells. But then when I, I, I moved um, and back to, uh, to Belgium and, and uh, set up my own lab, I, I began to be interested in two, um, two different um, tissue uh, that are glandular epithelia, the mammary gland and the prostate. And, and the, these two tissue are, uh, although you know, uh, make a, a very distinct whole, has a very kind of um, similar um, uh, architecture. And it's composed by uh, many by two cell uh, type, which is the luminal cell type and the basal cell type. And so the other uh, layer of the tube are the basal cells and the inner layer uh, of the tube are, are luminal cells. And um, that's, you know, cross section into a, a, a mammary gland um, uh, tube. And, and as you see here, the, the basal cell or the myepithelial cells uh, overlay a layer of luminal cells. And um, in, in the mammary gland is actually the, the first um, uh, ectodermal appendage um, that develop uh, during most embryonic development and, and, and the early um, stage of mammary gland development begin around E12.5 during uh, most embryonic development uh, by the formation of a little plaque coat. Um, and there's five pairs actually of mammary gland uh, in, uh, in the mouse and, um, and the, the, the bud along something that's called the, the milk line. Um, and, and they form a little black hole, which will eventually form a bud and, and that will rapidly branch already during embryonic development uh, into um, the underlying mesenchyme of the mammary gland, mammary gland which is called the mammary fat pad. And, and so the, the development proceeds already uh, uh, during um, the early stage and, and then it stops and, and it resumes uh, at the beginning of the puberty through the action of estrogen, um, which will um, lead to the, the, the elongation of the mammary gland and the branching of the mammary gland uh, uh, to fill completely the mammary fat pad. And then um, during um, uh, adult life, uh, during uh, pregnancy, the mammary gland uh, further develop through the action of progesterone and, and prolactin and will form uh, the milk producing cells, which is uh, a certain uh, cell type uh, that will form what is called the alveoli. And the alveoli are the milk producing cells and they complete, they, 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 they grow enormously during uh, pregnancy and they will completely fill the, the mammary fat pad. And, 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 and will produce the milk uh, throughout uh, the lactation period. At the end of the lactation, the mammary gland involutes um, and go back to more or less to its uh, virgin appearance. And then uh, another cycle of, of, uh, of growth can occur uh, through a next stage of um, pregnancy and lactation. And so for you know, a very long time, uh, already in the late 1960s uh, or, or 1950s, sorry, um, people were studying um, the, the stem cell of, of, the, uh, of the mammary gland by transplanting um, the piece of epithelial cells in the um, mammary fat pad that has been clear. Clear, it means that you remove uh, the epithelial uh, cells before uh, the epithelial uh, epithelium uh, uh, grow into the fat pad. So you have some whole, you know, virgin fat pad in which you can transplant a little piece of cells. And then uh, this stroma will provide the necessary signal for uh, mammary gland um, development. And um, in the mid 2000, um, two um, independent group, the group of Caniz and the group of Jane Bisveder published a very you know, important paper showing that you can um, isolate the basal cells here um, and the luminal cells here and, um, and, and isolate these cells and transplant them into the mammary fat pad. And they show that um, 
even, uh, but at a very low efficiency, but even a single cell, uh, basal cells, can reform a complete mammary gland uh, upon transplantation into the mammary fat, mammary fat band. Whereas the, lumin the transplantation of luminal cells is not productive um, to give rise to uh, mammary epithelium. And that led um, this investigator to propose a model in which uh, the, the basal stem cells were at the top of the cellular hierarchy um, during uh, adult mammary gland and give rise to progenitor of the luminal lineage or the basal uh, lineage. Um, and, and some, some, um, some uh, signal would uh, promote their um, differentiation. Um, but something that we know we've learned in the skin um, is that the potential of the cells upon transplantation do not always uh, mimic their fate during um, homeostasis in the absence of injury. And, 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 and we, what we learn in, in the skin is when we transplant the, some, some cells, um, it creates a kind of wounding on, uh, environment that expanded the lineage potential of uh, the, the, the hair follicle stem cell. And so we decided to, uh, and that, that at that time, nobody you know, really had um, the tools to uh, assess the fate of the mammary gland epithelium um, within uh, their uh, natural microenvironment and, and to do a lineage tracing experiment. So in lineage tracing experiment, you use different um, lineage uh, specific promoter that express an inducible Cree, for example, and upon the activation of this Cree, you lay, you remove a stop cassette, and so you label uh, the cells that are expressing this um, this Cree and all their um, progeny. And this is, you know, an irreversible uh, tagging, and 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 so it, it's very, you know, uh, very useful to assess the fate of the cells uh, within um, homeostatic condition. And so we generate a bunch of new Cree line, K8 and K18, uh, and, and we, 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 we put our hands on, on, on new Cree that allow to target either the, the basal cells uh, or uh, the, the luminal cells as you see here. And um, when we did that, you know, uh, we first performed the lineage tracing of the basal cells uh, of the mammary gland. And, and, uh, and, to, uh, and so we initiate the, the, the lineage tracing at um, four weeks uh, postnatally. So uh, meaning that it's at the beginning of the puberty and we analyze the fate of these cells at the end of, of the puberty and, uh, and also uh, in, in, in the adult uh, cells and even after pregnancy. And so we were expecting that the labeling of the, of the basal cells will spread out uh, from the, the basal lineage to, the, to label the luminal compound. But to our great surprise, when we did this uh, experiment, we realized that the, the basal cells only give rise to the basal cells. And, and the proportion of, of labeled cells remain grossly constant, meaning that you know, we label uh, the, the tissue um, proportionally to, to, to what it had expand afterwards. Uh, uh, but but uh, um, in contrast to our expectation, the luminal lineage were not labeled uh, by this uh, lineage tracing. So we're you know a bit surprised by that, and we uh, when we generate the, the and, and did the lineage tracing lineage tracing using the luminal um, driven tree, uh, we can label nicely the, the luminal cells to begin with, and and, and ten weeks after. Uh, the, the, the luminal cells were still uh, marked and, uh, during the whole process of, of tissue expansion. And the proportion of, of, of chimerism of luminal uh, YFP cells uh, remained constant toward the experiment. So it means that these cells were not replaced by an unable cell population uh, during this um, expansion um, uh, phase that accompanied puberty. And uh, 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 we did the same experiment during uh, pregnancy, lactation, involution, and, and the things were exactly identical. So the luminal gave rise to the luminal cells and the basal gave rise to the basal cells. So we, you know, we saw, okay, maybe um, it was the, the transplantation um, that uh, created 
this um, wounding like uh, fate and, and, and expand the, the lineage potential of these cells. So the first experiment that we did was to label the basal cells, but to co-transplant the ba label basal cells and the luminal unlabeled uh, cells here. And when we did this experiment, we realized that the, when you co-transplant the basal and the luminal cells together, um, the, the basal cells um, remain unipotent and only give rise to the basal lineage. And the luminal cells uh, also were, uh, stay unipotent and only give rise to the, the luminal cells, whereas the basal cells were unable. So the transplantation per se is not activating the multipotency. So we said, okay, maybe um, is the, 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 the association of basal and luminal cells together um, that restricted um, the multipotency of the basal cells. So we uh, fax isolate only the basal cells um, uh, without the luminal cells and, and graft the, the, these uh, basal cells that in lineage tracing only give rise to the, the the, the basal lineage. And when we did this experiment, we realized that the, 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 the cells that are unipotent in lineage tracing, when they are graft alone in the absence of luminal cells in the mammary fat, but no, they can expand their lineage uh, potential and give rise to all the different lineage. Then already at, in, in this paper, we begin to decrease the number of uh, luminal cells uh, the ratio of basal and luminal cells. And, and at a ratio of five to one, we found that in some of the graphs, the basal cells and the luminal cells kept their lineage restricted potential, whereas in other um, grafted uh, that stimulate the basal cell multipotency. So clearly the ratio of basal and luminal cells were key in restricting the multipotency of uh, the basal cell lineage. So, you know, from this first study, we could conclude that in contrast to the current dogma at that time, um, th there were no uh, uh, multipotent stem cell on the top of the hierarchy uh, in um, the, the, the mammary gland. And they, the, the, in, in adult or, or, or after puberty the, or during puberty, the, the basal cells and the luminal cells are maintained by their own pool of unipotent stem cell or unipotent progenitor that will uh, sustain the homeostasis and the expansion of, of their uh, own cell type. So, the, uh, sorry, um, it was hypothesized that, uh, you know, initially during embryonic development, um, the cells were multipotent, but that again was not, you know, formally um, demonstrated. So we decided to uh, perform um, lineage tracing at the early stage of mammary gland development and to trace a single cell within this mammary um, bud at E13. And for that, we were using a, a K14 RTT to create system so we can you know, um, titrate the dose of doxycycline uh, very precisely. So to label one single uh, uh, cells within the mammary gland uh, but and, and assess their fate um, at a later time point uh, when uh, the basal and the luminal lineage were already uh, segregated. And um, to what was previously proposed, uh, we found that uh, almost all um, label cells at the early beginning of embryonic uh, mammary gland development were um, multipotent, giving rise to um, luminal uh, and uh, basal cells. Something that were also a little bit surprising is that the luminal cells and, and the basal cells were not always um, uh, sitting ne uh, next to each other. And sometimes they were part of the branch that were composed of basal cells and then part of the branch of, of, of luminal label cells. And sometimes uh, we, we could find, you know, within a tube um, the, the cells, uh, the two cell type uh, within uh, the same branch. Um, but when we did the same experiment at P1, when you know when when the this, uh, the, the 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 newborn mice were were just you know uh, born, uh, already at that time, the basal uh, cells were completely segregated 
and only give rise to the uh, basal lineage uh, thereafter. So these tell us that the switch from multipotency um, to unipotency of the basal cells occur during uh, the course of the embryonic development. Um, we, were, we did not precisely determine that, but um, th there was a, a, a another group uh, led by Sylvia Frey at the Curie Institute in Paris, who did that at different time points during development. And her uh, conclusion was the lineage aggregation between multipotency to unipotency occur around E17.5 during a most embryonic um, development. So to understand what that means, you know, uh, at the molecular level, uh, being, you know, bipotent or multipotent, um, we isolated uh, using a LGR5 reporter system. So LGR5, is a, it's, it's only expressed in this um, early bud. And so we thought we, we did the, uh, the, this uh, isolation before the formation of hair follicle, because the hair follicle would also form a little bud like that, which also express LGR5 during embryonic development. So to, to, to do that properly, you, you really need to uh, isolate this mammary uh, bud, you know, before the, uh, the emergence of the hair follicle um, uh, placard and, 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 um, and, and bud. Um, and so we isolate this cells and we perform, um, you know, different type of analysis. And so here I'm just showing you the single cell um, uh, sequencing. And we did that um, with Thierry Wood and Alessandro Zifrim. Um, we, at that time, we did um, uh, smart sig 2 uh, after uh, fax isolation. And as you see here, that's a, you know, an, an uh, adult gland. So the adult, are, 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 um, you, you find you know, three population uh, when you do unsupervised clustering. You have the basal cells and two types of luminal cells. I'll come back to that a little bit later. And, and the embryonic uh, mammary gland progenitor um, they segregate a little bit um, uh, separately from, from this lineage, although they are more close, uh, at, at least in the dimension two, uh, to, the, to the basal cells uh, as compared to the uh, luminal cell lineage. And when we um, assess the expression of the luminal cell uh, specific marker at the, or, or basal cells marker in this embryonic progenitor, what you see here is this embryonic progenitor, they co-express at the single cell level a, a lot of basal and luminal markers. So what means uh, being multipotent is means that you co-express at the same time within the same cells two different uh, transcriptional programs, the one from the basal and the one from uh, the, the luminal uh, lineage. Um, and so, as I said, you know, these two papers were published, you know, back to back uh, a, few, a couple of years ago with, together with the paper uh, of uh, Sylvia Frey that report very uh, similar finding. So I told you that the luminal adult lineage uh, consists actually in um, two different uh, population by single cell uh, transcriptomic. And uh, it was known for, you know, already a very long time that a fraction of the luminal cells express um, uh, estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor, they are the uh, hormone responsive cells uh, that are essential uh, to um, control and to relay um, the hormonal signal um, that are uh, initiated um, from um, the hypothalamus um, and, and who ensure the, the uh, and, and then the, the ovary um, during uh, um, the ovary and uh, during uh, pregnancy um, as well. And um, so the, the, the year, uh, the ro roughly 50% um, of year positive and in, in, in year negative um, cells. And, and, there, uh, and these numbers do not vary much over the time. And the, again, the current dogma at that time was that the year pierre expressing cells were terminally differentiated and um, where uh, the, the, the progeny of the year negative cells that proliferate more actively. Is that true? To do that, we generate a new um, 
uh, mouse model to lineage trace um, the ER positive um, lineage uh, using a near FTT to Cree uh, YFP system. And as you see here, uh, we can nicely label the, the, the ER positive cells, but the ER positive cells during puberty had expanded um, uh, proportionally again to the tissue and the chimeries remain constant, meaning again that these ER positive cells are not replaced by a near negative population uh, during uh, pubert pubertal uh, expansion. However, during pregnancy, the proportion of ER positive cells decreased dramatically um, and, and as the alveoli cells are mostly uh, composed by a ER negative uh, population. But when uh, after the pregnancy, you reset and you return somehow to the base, baseline level. And it's the same cells that were um, ER positive cells uh, at before pregnancy that repopulate the ER uh, positive lineage uh, after uh, the involution and, and even throughout several cycles uh, of lactation and involution. Meaning that somehow they behave like long leaf stem cells that can repopulate the whole ER positive lineage uh, uh, following uh, pregnancy. So um, this study really, you know, were a kind of a new paradigm in the field and, and show that somehow um, the multipotent stem cell only exists during embryonic development. And afterwards, during postnatal life, all the different lineage, the basal cells, the ER positive cells, and the ER negative cells are sustained by their own pool of um, uh, unipotent or lineage restricted uh, uh, potential um, and, and, you know, different group as, uh, as report the same finding around uh, that time. That was the group of, uh, of Sylvia Frey also using a notch lineage to um, uh, uh, lineage tracing to label the ER negative cells and, and, and the Guo um, uh, who used, you know, uh, other type of tree but uh, arrived at the same conclusion. So is this um, unipotency can be changed by, you know, uh, for example, uh, oncogene. And here, you know, I'm going to show you that when you activate PI3 kinase, uh, C P3CA, which, you know, is the most frequent um, uh, oncogene activated uh, in uh, luminal breast cancer, when you activate this gene um, in um, the uh, luminal lineage here, you can generate it. Um, some um, de novo, some, some basal cells. So the oncogenic expression of uh, Petrissier can reactivate it, um, a multipotent program in normally lineage committed uh, uh, luminal uh, population. Um, and this finding was also found by another group of, uh, led by uh, Mohamed Ben Tires Aji in, in, in Basel University. Uh, and, and, and the same thing, when you activate uh, Petrissier in basal cells, you can also generate um, new, the formation of new luminal cells, although this transition from the basal cells were uh, much more slow than the one that we observe when we activate um, the oncogene and, and the luminal cell lineage. So um, I told you that, you know, the, the, the prostate um, is quite, you know, uh, similar in, in, in its architecture as the mammary gland. And, um, and uh, it's, uh, you can see here, you know, that's the, 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 the whole mount of the, of the uh, mouse prostate and that's the cross -sec section uh, uh, and, and 3D reconstruction. So you have, you know, a layer of basal cells here. And, and, and luminal cells uh, inside uh, of the tube. And, um, and so the, the, the prostate uh, development uh, begin, you know, also at the end of the, uh, of the embryonic development by the formation of a, of a bud uh, that will also grow uh, in, in, in uh, uh, several buds actually, that will also grow in the underlying mesenchyme and which will differentiate into uh, uh, basal cells here in red or, 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 or luminal cells 
uh, in green. In addition to that, you have, you know, some uh, more rare neuroendocrine cells um, that uh, express uh, different uh, 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 protein and gene uh, of the neuronal uh, lineage. And so when we perform similar type of uh, lineage tracing um, at uh, P1, uh, just after the, the mouse uh, were born, uh, using the, the, the same tree that we uh, use in, in the mammary gland. But this time, when you label the basal cells, uh, these basal cells will give rise to uh, the, the luminal uh, lineage um, uh, during the course of embryonic development and all, also will give rise to uh, the neuroendocrine cells. So um, that contrasts with the, the lineage restriction that we observe already at P1 uh, in the mammary gland, uh, at least in, in, in the prostate at P1, uh, the, uh, the cells, basal cells were uh, really uh, multipotent. Uh, and so we decide to um, try to refine a little bit um, this data because we knew from uh, other group that in adults, um, the, also the basal cells and the, uh, the luminal cells are also sustained by their own pool of unipotent progenitor. And so the question that arrived there was when um, this lineage restriction occur during the course of um, prostate um, postnatal um, development. So we decided to perform lineage tracing not only at P1, but at different time point during um, the course of postnatal uh, prostate development. And so when we, we, we did that um, uh, during the, the, the from, from P1 to P5, uh, so the, 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 the early days, both the, 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 the tips and the duct uh, were filled with uh, uh, green luminal cells showing that um, the already uh, at that time, there was no sp spatial restriction uh, of uh, multipotency uh, during uh, prostate uh, development. However, um, around P15, um, so just before uh, the beginning um, of the puberty, uh, the um, multipotent basal cells were only found at the, at the end of the tube in, in a region that's called the tips region. You see here, you, you label initially uh, the, the, the tips, they all green only in the basal cells, and, and, and few, uh, two weeks later, they feel a complete uh, end of this tube uh, with the luminal cells. But in the same mouse, when you look at the, uh, the more um, uh, proximal um, uh, duct, they were, uh, you only label the basal cells here, and, and these basal cells are, uh, kept uh, they're labeling only in the basal lineage and they do not give rise uh, to luminal cells, which were already self-sustained by their own pool of luminal uh, progenitors. And, and at, uh, at, the, at P21, at the beginning of the puberty, the, uh, even the tips region were devoid of multipotent cells. And, and it means that at the beginning of the puberty, it's where the whole uh, prostate will considerably expand it. And so the initial patterning and the initial branching were done uh, and, and generated by the multipotent set. But the whole tissue expansion that occurred during puberty were performed uh, by a unipotent uh, progenitor and, and, and stem cell basal and uh, luminal. Um, and as I said, during uh, adult homeostasis, as well as uh, prostate uh, mediate re regeneration, um, the basal cells only give rise to the basal cells and the luminal uh, uh, cells only give rise um, to the uh, luminal lineage, showing that uh, in, in, in regenerative condition or in neomostatic condition, this uh, cell lineage uh, are uh, self-sustained by their own pool of progenitor. So what I show you here is um, that the early postnatal development are mediated by, you know, multipotent or bipotent progenitor uh, that can give rise to unipotent basal and un unipotent uh, luminal progenitor. And uh, in other, they are um, completely uh, segregated. So then, um, since I told you that the, the in 
during transplantation of the mammary gland. When you put luminal cells and basal cells together, they remain unipotent. When you remove the luminal cells, the basal cells become multipotent. And so we saw that okay, does the luminal cells tell the basal cells that they are there and they don't need the basal cells to produce the luminal cells? In other words, those the luminal cells uh, restrict the multipotency of, of the basal cells. And to test this question, uh, we generate a, a model um, in which we can label the, the basal cells by lineage tracing and kill the luminal cells using a, a, a dox-inducible dox system, which will express the diphtheria toxin um, and, and kill the luminal cells. And when we did that, indeed, the, um, when we kill the luminal cells, indeed, the basal cells can no give rise to the uh, red luminal um, uh, cells uh, in vivo, uh, two weeks uh, following uh, um, the lineage ablation. Uh, and that's also occur in, in the prostate. And, and we have test uh, the sweat gland and, and, the, and, and the salivary gland, which are also uh, sustained by their own pool of progenitor. And in all these four glandular epithelia, the, the killing the luminal cells is sufficient to activate the, um, the, the multipotency of the basal cell. There, were a, there was a paper um, uh, uh, that was published a few years ago uh, who showed that uh, upon a bacterial infection, uh, which may kill uh, luminal cells, there was an activation of the basal cell multipotency you know, consistent um, with this finding. So that's uh, what I told you, the lineal ablation reactivated multipotency uh, in, in, the, in the sweat glands and, and, and as well uh, uh, in, in the salivary gland. So then the question was, does um, the activation of the multipotency, is that due to the inflammation, due to the, the damage that we created? Uh, and to try to answer this question, we try to recapitulate these phenomena in, um, uh, in, in organoid cells in vitro without stromal cells, without inflammatory cells. And when we do the same experiment uh, and we activate, uh, when we kill the luminal cells, even in vitro in a mammary gland organoid, uh, we can uh, generate, um, uh, activate the basal cell multipotency and generate uh, luminal cells from basal cells. So we did the same type of um, single cell uh, transcriptomic analysis that I show you during embryonic development, but this time um, in uh, uh, using uh, mammary gland following lineage ablation, we isolate the basal and uh, the luminal cells as well as this an intermediated population that express an intermediated level of the, the marker of the basal and, and the luminal cells. And as you see here, the basal cells you know, are, are clustered together. The luminal cells are composed by two different entities. Uh, again, the, the, the ER positive and the ER negative. And all this intermediated population, they co-express uh, 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 co uh, basal and luminal cell marker. And so the reactivation of multipotency following lineage ablation, follow the same rules that we found during embryonic development, meaning that they co-express at the single cell level two uh, distinct transcriptional program, one of the basal and the other of the luminal uh, lineage. Um, we perform um, different uh, lineage trajectory analysis, and that show you that somehow the, 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 the basal cells, when they are activated, uh, and give rise this hybrid population, these hybrid cells will uh, uh, give rise immediately um, uh, either the ER positive or the ER negative, uh, but it's not through an intermediate of, let's say, of ER negative that they will uh, afterwards give rise to the ER positive lineage. So this cell has the potency to, uh, on, uh, during the process of the, of, of the regeneration, give rise direct, different, directly the two uh, different uh, lineage. So then, you know, we try to figure out what could be the mechanism, what is the molecule that the luminal cells would secrete it to promote, to restrict the multipotency of the basal cells. So we use all our different uh, single cell 
um, condition that we had and use a, 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 a software that was developed in the lab of Sarah Teichman, which is called Cellphone DB. And Cellphone DB computed within a set of, of, of single cell data, like and pair interaction that can exist between the same cell or, 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 the, or the different um, heterotypic uh, uh, pair. And uh, we were interested to check what was the, the heterotypic ligand receptor pair that were present only in the wild type condition, but not in the ablation and not in the embryonic progenitor where they were uh, multipotency. And, and we could, uh, you know, come up with a different candidate. And we, you know, there was TNF alpha that was predicted to, 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 um, to signal PDGFR, active in receptor and, and integrin um, uh, beta one. And so uh, we did a screen in the organoid and tried to inhibit or activate uh, this different, um, this different uh, pathway. And we found that um, blocking T TNF alpha was promoting the multipotency in, uh, in, in, in normal organoid, so without uh, luminal cell ablation, suggesting that TNF, are, TN, uh, TNF may be the ligand secreted by the luminal cells and, and that restrict the, the basal cells uh, multipotency. So we, um, we use that uh, in, in, in organoid and in mice and, and in, in both system when we block uh, the anti-TNF alpha antibody was blocking the, uh, sorry, was promoting the, the, the multipotency of the basal cells and the generation of luminal, of the luminal uh, level cells. Uh, we did the reverse experiment in which we lineage ablated um, the luminal cells and then add TNF alpha in our medium. And that the addition of TNF alpha was um, decreasing the, uh, the activation of multipotency induced by uh, the lineage ablation. So, um, you know, we conclude from this data that TNF alpha, uh, TNF receptor uh, one that is expressed by basal cells um, are uh, an important ligand pair interaction uh, that control uh, multipotency. Um, we then try to figure out, you know, what was the, uh, the, the signaling pathway that were activated upon lineage cell ablation in basal cells and that can promote multipotency. And we found that there was, you know, three, uh, signaling pathway that, that stand out it was the uh, notch signaling pathway, uh, that was the wind signaling pathway, and the uh, RBB uh, EGFR um, uh, pathway. So we decided to, to assess uh, one by one um, the role of this different pathway. And, and here that's in vivo, we, we, we induce the lineage ablation and then uh, inject blocking antibody of the Delta like one, Jack one and Jack two uh, that we received from uh, uh, Chris Sibel from Genentech and, and the, 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 the blocking notch pathway block the, the activation of multipotency induced uh, by lineage ablation. Same thing for the for LGK 974, which is a porcupine inhibitor that blocked the secretion of wind ligand and, and, and for which the uh, uh, in, in vitro or in vivo uh, administration of LGK 974 was decreasing um, the activation of multipotency and the generation of luminal cells uh, from the basal cells. And, and same thing uh, for the um, uh, RBB uh, inhibitor uh, that, uh, that was also you know, uh, blocking uh, the proliferation and, and the activation of uh, multipotency. Um, in uh, this uh, different system. So you now what we're trying to do in, in the lab is trying to, to use all the different combination that we have studied so far, embryonic development, um, uh, the transplantation of basal cell only, uh, lineage ablation and oncogene expression, and try to find, is there a common mechanism across all these different um, experimental condition that promote multipotency? both in the mammary gland uh, and the prostate. And, and maybe the next time uh, uh, that uh, I see you, I will be able to, you know, to tell you what are these uh, uh, common um, mechanisms uh, that are, are regulating multipotency in the prostate and in the mammary gland 
uh, in all um, these um, different conditions. Um, with that, uh, I'll thank uh, the people who did the work. So the early uh, work uh, of lineage tracing was done, uh, uh, and Petrissier was done by Alexandra van Kemelen, uh, senior researcher in my lab. Uh, Marco uh, was uh, 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 used um, study with Alexandra the the year lineage segregation. Schwenlin and Alicia Sentanze did uh, with Elsa Tika um, did all the the lineage ablation study, and 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 Alicia. And uh, Elsa also studied the postnatal um, development of the prostate, and, and Gael uh, helped um, this little group um, uh, to uh, do um, their uh, experiment and, 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 and genotyping of the uh, mouse colony that are required for that. And for that, also, I, I thank so, you know, our collaborator uh, here for this work in particular, Thierry Woods and Alessandro Zifrim, who really are key. Uh, in in our single cell um, analysis and and uh, Christos uh, Soterio and Ben Phillips who help us with the Petrissier um, experiment um, and and with that you know I thank uh, the rest of my group and, and our funders um, to allow us to um, do the the research that we can do thank you very much for at your attention and I will be very happy to answer your question. Thank you, Cedric. That was outstanding. Um, so I wanted to, yeah, ask ask a question about this this um, switch from multipotency to unipotency, and it seems like mammary gland, prostate gland, maybe have slightly different timing. And then you mentioned a few times the onset of puberty. So do you think that there's a role for the the puberty related hormones? in restricting the multipotency? Um, yeah, that's a clearly an interesting question. Uh, I, I'm wondering whether, you know, um, I, I don't know, you know, because it, I'm not sure that the level of the hormones were, but that probably, you know, that better than me, were progressively raising during, um, let's say the infancy, because already during the whole early step, the, 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 the multipotency remain only at the tip region, you know, after P8. And so is, is you know, I don't know whether um, the, the duct and, and the tips experience different level of uh, hormone signaling uh, during, before the pubertal development, you know, that's something that, that I don't know. So uh, in other words, I think it's a good question, but I don't know the precise answer to this question. So we have a couple questions about um, multipotency and cancer. So yeah, could you kind of speculate on what do you think is the role of multipotency in cancer development? And do you think that some of the things you found, for example, like inhibiting TNF alpha, could this be used to sort of prevent cancer development? Yeah, so clearly, you know, we think, but, you know, we haven't demonstrated that, but, you know, we are working on, on testing this, this hypothesis, that in certain um, case, indeed, the, the, the switch from uh, unipotency to multipotency may be key to initiate tumor development. For example, during prostate um, uh, cancer development, so most, uh, so the, the luminal lineage are, you know, very good and very efficient at initiated uh, prostate tumor agenesis upon P10 division. But the basal cells can do the job. But the basal cells need a little bit longer time to initiate tumor development. And this timing, when you deleted P10 in basal cells, similarly to what is happening when you activate Pictricier in, in, you know, in the mammary epithelium, you generate de novo from the basal cells, you reactivate multipotency. And, and, and since the, the, the prostate tumor are very you know, luminal uh, lineage, uh, we think that this, when they originate from the basal cells, clearly we think that we, the, the first step is to activating this multipotent program uh, before the, 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 and generate de novo uh, luminal cells before the, the tumor can uh, really uh, start to grow. Uh, and, 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 and we are, you know, testing the, the, the same ID uh, in uh, the mammary gland. And so uh, 
we, we, we are trying now to, to check indeed with TNF or you know, other method if blocking multipotency uh, can uh, decrease or, or delay tumor appearance or, or, or block tumor initiation uh, altogether. Yes, this is something that we, 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 are, we think it's a worth it uh, hypothesis that uh, uh, needs to, to, to do further st study on that particular, for address this particular question. Great. So there's a question about, it's almost a philosophical question about what does multipotency mean? Essentially asking when the basal cells have a restricted multipotency later in life, is it, is it really that they don't have multipotency or do they just not need to because the luminal cells are there? Exactly. So that, it's more of a sem indeed a semantical question. So indeed, you, you can you can say that somehow they, they are, they, these cells are always multipotent, but their fate is restricted by you know the the the, 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 the tissue organization or the cell cell communication and 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 other other things like that. Yes, you can say that. All right. So um, here's a question about um, can you swap cells from the prostate and the mammary gland? Can you, can you take luminal cells from one organ and basal cells from the other and put them together? And do they actually care their origin? I don't know if that's something that you've tried. So we never did this particular experiment with the basal and the prostate, but I think we will know <laughs> that you asked. Um, like 20 years ago, people has done that by transplanting um, skin in the mammary gland. And the mammary fat pad seems to be sufficient to reprogram skin cells into a mammary gland type of, uh, of stem cell. And so meaning that really the mammary fat pad is dominant uh, in some microenvironment that can be very, you know, uh, had a profound effect on, on the fate of, of the cell. Um, you know, of course, both the skin and, and, and the mammary uh, lineage have, have a common origin, are, you know, more similar, uh, at least, you know, uh, from, from their uh, historical perspective. So I don't know whether the prostate can be as well reprogrammed, as, but I think it's, a, again, it's a cool question and it's, it's worth it to try. It's not that complicated. That's great. Um, well, it sounds like there's a, a lot of a lot of different ways uh, potentially to, to look at these questions of how do these stem cells um, sort of unleash this potential, whether in, in normal conditions and, and in cancer. So I, uh, I'm very much looking forward to the, the next few years of, of discoveries out of, out of your lab and, and others so that we can really kind of kind of put this together of, of what are the outside signals, what are the inside signals? Yeah. Um, Okay, well, one, one more question from, uh, from Bill. Um, can you rule out that there is not a multipotent cell in the tissue not marked by keratin-14? More or less, yes, in, in the sense that when you label all the luminal cells, huh? so we did that, we call that lineage tracing as saturation. So if we la you label all K8 positive cells, so 99.9% .9 of the K8, the, this chimerism remains completely constant over time, even during pregnancy. So then you can say, well, maybe your multipotent was expressing K, that's possible. You know? uh, but again, the, the, the ER lineage are self-sustained, the ER negative cells are self-sustained. So there's no reason to think that there's any uh, flux of cells from an unable compartment in this uh, different condition. So I think I would say yes. <laughs> Sounds very logical. Outstanding. All right. Well, um, that was a, a truly wonderful talk. And uh, we, we will let you go so you can get some sleep tonight. And really, thanks, we'll uh, thanks again. You know, it was a very uh, uh, great time. And I and, uh, hope to, to see you all uh, very soon. Um, in meetings and, and in the real life. See you soon. All right. Bye. Bye.